Hi, this is Indira Chaudhary, and I teach at the Center for Public History in Srishti in Bangalore. And one of the things we do a lot of is recording oral history. And I think that's what I'm going to talk about here. So I'll begin with the question all of us really worry about how do we define oral history? And especially in uh, you know, a place like India where there is so much of oral traditions, there's so much of folklore that is oral, uh, we tend to often use the two terms interchangeably. But as an oral historian, when I talk about oral history, I don't mean uh, oral traditions. I mean the long interview which is recorded. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. So what is oral history? And this is what we often break our heads over that is it the recording? Is it what you record? Is it what you transcribe? Or are we referring to the method of gathering evidence in this manner as a research method that is oral history? And what most of us have discovered is that oral history is all three. It is the recording, it is the transcription, but it is also the method by which you do the research. So uh, often we use this term almost interchangeably with the life story interview or the life review interview or the personal narrative. And I think what I'm going to emphasize that in oral history, there are two people involved. There is somebody who is asking the questions. The questions are being framed by an oral historian. And the function of the oral historian is really to jog the memory of the person who is being interviewed. And I think, uh, you know, when we look at how social sciences look at oral history, uh, Often, I think in the beginning, there was a lot of distrust of this method because, you know, social scientists are taught not to manufacture evidence. And this was seen as, you know, the prompt of the oral historian was seen as something that was trying to create evidence. But actually, when oral historians started thinking about it, they came up with a different explanation because they said what is happening is this is the creation of evidence. This is not really manufactured evidence. And they went further by saying this is not just creation of evidence, there is co-creation of evidence. And that is where I think oral history differs from you know, other modes where the interviewee and the interviewer together create something. And, and that is what, you know, is then interpreted, whatever they're creating. And that is often new knowledge, new information. But more and more, there has been an emphasis on how do people make meaning? What is this process of meaning making that happens when we you know, start doing these oral history interviews. And here I think there's some concepts that we have to pay attention to. And that is uh, the historian Michael Frisch, who did both oral history and public history, gave us this concept of the shared authority. And shared authority is a term that he talks about where there is shared responsibility, where the listener and the person who's talking, who's speaking, actually have an equal responsibility in creating and interpreting what, you know, what new knowledge they are moving towards. And I think this becomes very, very important. Then the other objection that often social scientists had to oral history was that, you know, this is not objective research. Uh, how do we deal with that? And oral historians like Alessandro Portelli, 
has uh, alerted us, us to the fact that why can't we look at it as why why don't we take subjectivity and turn it on its head and say this is research that is subjective so let us try and understand what is happening there is no uh, objective position and he says that because he says that as a listener as the interviewer you are expected to also modify your position the way you think of yourself your own awareness of yourself in the course of the interview and therefore subjectivity but also intersubjectivity subjectivity of you yourself as the interviewer and the interviewee both become very very important and i think uh, sometimes and what is very very important to oral historians is that we work with memory and you know that's why often there are these accusations oh isn't memory unreliable isn't you know this something that you're not going to quite get right but actually what uh, oral historians have found is that even in the written document it there may be inaccuracy inaccuracy of a certain kind so what they have gone on to argue is that there are two levels of engagement you try to find out why the person says what he or she does say and you also want to find out what how does memory work in this context and i'll give a little example one is from potelli's famous work which is called the death of luigi trastulli and other stories the main essay in that book is called the death of luigi trastulli now luigi trastulli is a union worker in a uh, in a steel factory in terni and he uh, dies in 1949 the entire town when potelli starts doing his work say that no no he died in 1953 and of course this would be enough ground to say look memory is not reliable so do not try to believe them but he says no this is not a matter of belief let us try to find the reasons why they say 53 and therefore potelli has very powerfully argued that it is important to look at all this what is called misinformation or misremembering and when he starts doing the research he sees that there are many versions people have many ways in which you know they want to talk about this one death and then he finds out that in 49 it was really a protest that was about nato it was about peace it was not about the factory and at the same time he also finds out that when he was shot dead the entire union had said we will not let people rest we will really do something about this terrible injustice that had happened and in the course of uh, you know his research he finds out actually they did nothing and in 1953 when the union actually rises up in arms and does a protest that is not worthy that's when memory channels everything to that moment and he has a very powerful argument about how memory is used and i think you know it tells you about how people remember how people choose not to remember and therefore that is as historical as uh, in uh, if you, if you gave the argument that you know this was memory that was uh, misremembering then you don't have much but you know since he pursues it you get a very rich history from my own experience while doing the oral history archives of uh, you know tata institute of fundamental research which was set up by homi baba i found that there was a moment when all scientists were telling me about his sudden death as you know he died in an air crash quite unexpectedly and uh, you know the whole institute was in mourning now when i asked them okay 
how did you get the news? What did you do that day? Almost all of them told me that, you know, we had a condolence meeting and then we went back to work because that's what Dr. Baba would have liked. Now, a few months later, when I start setting up the archives, I found these photographs, which were of a Parsi death ritual happening right below the library staircase in TIFR. And at that point, I go back to the scientists, to some of them, to ask that, what is this, you know? There is obviously something happening here, which is not quite as you have told me, that, you know, this is not a condolence ceremony. So he said, oh, oh, yes, of course we did this. This was done for his mother, because, you know, his mother had wanted this, and this seemed the appropriate place to have it. And it told me that there were several ways in which people remember. Official memory becomes very strong sometimes in, in, in the universe, in the institutional context. But the other thing was this very personal connection that this institute had with the family is something as the institute grew up, it was not always remembered. And so, you know, there are different ways in which memory functions and it gives you interesting insights about the institution or how people remember. Now, coming now to, you know, other uh, forms of interviews that I think your uh, course is looking at, particularly because you're looking at ethnography. I think one of the things that happens in ethnography is ethnography works with time and space. It asks people at a particular time, in a particular space, about whatever the ethnographer wants to find out. And the ethnographic interview, often the interviewer has to revise questions as he or she learns more about the place. Now, in the case of you know oral history interviews, we actually uh, work more with memory and more with meaning making than with you know time and space. Of course, we are looking at time because we are looking at you know tell me what happened on that first day of independence in 1947. But uh, we don't uh, really look at uh, something that is in the present, because we believe, as oral historians, that we think of the past in the present. When we are doing an oral history interview, it is a document that is created in the present, but it is about the past. So, you know, you, you have a very uh, rich uh, sort of layered history that comes to you. Of course, the long interview is also something that uh, sociologists do as the qualitative interview. And the qualitative interview, again, is different because the qualitative interview often has a subject. It is trying to understand from a group of people about something. Whereas in oral history, we focus on individual memories and we try to locate those memories and contextualize them and see how is this remembering happening at this time? And so, you know, that is, uh, you know, those are the differences. And I think when we look at the, you know, oral history interview and what we are left with in the end, I think oral history demands from us a certain kind of shift in the way we look at that material. Because, uh, you know, you can look at the transcription, it, but it's not enough because if you listen to it, if you listen to the interview, you'd find the way in which people speak, the, the volume, the rapidity of speech, all of these are also bearers of meaning. It is not as if, you know, only the content gives you that process of meaning making. So I think this is what, you know, we do, which is different from other forms of interviewing. And of course, we are focused on 
the past. We are trying to understand the past, but the present is always there. So uh, basically, I think the oral history method goes into a lot of, you know, uh, details of a person's life. And I think an ethnographic interview might gain from some of its methods because you might get a deeper context to what you're doing. For example, I had done interviews with the uh, scroll painters of Bengal, the Patachitrakars. And, uh, you know, that they sing a lot of uh, songs which are about disasters, which are about the tsunami or about the floods. And uh, I remember, and there's even one which is about 9-11. And, you know, it is so far removed from their lives. So I think it was because I was doing an oral history interview, I asked them, I said, you know, why do you sing about 9-11? You have seen it on television. It is not something that, uh, you know, you have experienced. So what what is this song really about? Is it because you felt these butts, these scrolls will sell? They said, no, you know, we can't write our song without really believing, you know, that we are right, you know, that we are there part of the story. I said, so how are you part of the story? He said, look, I think we have suffered so much. We know that we have the experience of floods almost every other year. We know uh, what it means to lose a family member to uh, snake bite. We know about loss. And because we know about loss, we could empathize with people who lost their own during this disaster. And, you know, if it was an ethnographic interview, you wouldn't have got this detail. He was relating this event to his life and telling me why at that point he felt that he could actually understand what these people who he had never met in America or the people who suffered the tsunami uh, went through. And I think somewhere this empathy, of course, all interviews demand empathy. But I think the oral history interview empathizes with the people's lives and it also engages with their lives. And that's why you end up asking questions which is about their life, which you can then bring as a different layer onto your ethnographic interview. So I feel, you know, it would gain if you asked a few questions that were more detailed, in-depth and about you know, that person's life. Now, what the ethnographic interviewer can learn from the oral history interviewer is that we go into details of people's lives and try to understand why today they are the way they are. What is it in their experience that has shaped them? Well, I think uh, one of the things that oral historians do, they actually engage with memory. And uh, I think sometimes there have been questions that, you know, can historians engage with memory in this way? And that, that is a very deep question because, you know, sometimes uh, we pointed out that why talk about memory as being unreliable? Because memory is helping you reconstruct, co-construct a range of things. And even ethnographers today are talking about construction rather than, you know, just culturally, you know, representing something. So I think oral historians tend to bring in, you know, history and memory and talk about how the memory of something can help us reconstruct the past. And you might do it with the help of photographs, documents, and other things. But you would not dismiss memory uh, at all, because memory is part of an individual's experience. But oral history mainly engages with memory 
and with meaning making how does my experience of the past enable me to uh, you know make a meaning about what what history is what does my experience tell me about uh, you know what, what i'm reading or what you know if if i have my family talk about the partition then you know what what is it that they're doing in order for it to become meaningful for them so all the partition stories which i grew up listening to which were basically about a village they had left behind were really about making sense of their lives now but it's very different from the here and the now that the ethnographer is trying to capture and so that that remains a difference and you ask also about you know orality and of course you know one of the things about oral history is that we are looking at the spoken word we are looking at people speaking about their experience it is not uh, a diary where someone has written about the past but it is people talking about their past and orality is about the here and now it it happens in time it happens in the present but this orality is about many things it is about how we speak about the past what is the language in which that past becomes most meaningful to me for example my grandmother would only speak in her dialect of east bengal when she recollected those times but if she spoke about how she struggled to become a teacher in calcutta and how aware she was that she could never go back to that place after 1947 she would use a very different language which was you know not that dialect of a village and i think you know oral historians are also very aware of these kinds of differences that you see and even going back to my example of the patichitrakar of the scroll scroll painters uh there they are used to singing or telling their stories in a particular way and if we were to look at the oral history interviews and compare it to the way in which their other oral narratives are shaped you'd find similarities and differences and i think that's why for oral historians language is so important the you know the oral is so important because you know it communicates so much more than just the content of what is being said